So I guess if we could just get started, uh, Dr. Lofton, thinking about, again, in family practice that you're seeing people across all parts of really the spectrum, um, you know, the, the cradle to grave um, idea, but also knowing that um, part, part of that is kind of talking about mental health and some of those crises, and you're not just seeing people um, for physical health concerns. Um, reflecting back on your training, what what training did you receive specific to suicide and managing patients at risk of suicide? In residency, um, we, we received some training. I would say it's probably minimal. This is, you know, I graduated residency in 2007, so I'm starting to age myself here. But, uh, you know, we, we did some. We had mental health at the hospital that we worked with. We could admit patients. At that time, we lived in an um, you know, uh, area that probably has a quarter million people. In general, there's several hospitals in the area. But um, that was, so that was, you know, 15 years ago. But ultimately, our training was involved trying to call the uh, inpatient psych ward and trying to get people admitted. Um, we didn't get a whole lot of training on in the office, uh, how to deal with suicide. You know, we would do our questionnaires and, you know, if somebody had a positive questionnaire, I can remember making sure you get a consent if they didn't want to, uh, get admitted to make sure like a do no harm type contract. And I still do that stuff, but, um, it, it was probably minimal training. I mean, at, at best, just, I think of obesity and that's, that's something else we got, we got minimal training in some things. Um, we touched a lot of areas, but there were some areas we just probably didn't get as much in. And that was one of them. So how comfortable now are you in managing a patient who presents to you with a risk of suicidal ideation? You know, I, I see a lot of mental health uh, with the COVID crisis. I'd say that's probably increased some. And I do feel comfortable dealing with mental health. Um, I prescribe a lot of uh, medicine for people dealing with depression or anxiety. Um, I, I don't frequently have people come into the office who are suicidal, although that has happened on a few occasions. And we, of course, have some inpatient facilities where we can call and get them admitted to. Um, so, you know, in general, I feel like I, I, whether it be a crisis of emergency, you know, heart attack nature or um, people coming in, different crises, I feel pretty comfortable in general handling crises. Um, the the suicide aspect of it, I, I just feel like we're somewhat handcuffed. Um, we don't have a lot of resources or uh, available options in rural Arkansas, and I'm sure you could say rural Montana, or rural Florida, wherever you're going to you know, call call on a rural doctor. It, it's it's kind of like the um, right now. There's a you know big emphasis on um, looking at whether people have food insecurity or transportation problems. Well, we we can ask those questions, but we can't help them very much in rural rural America. And so that that's the I think uh, there's a big need to help us in rural areas to be able to get the resources we need to help our patients. So specific to that, can you talk a little bit about um, what you've seen in your community around how suicide impacts your patient community and kind of the broader community where you practice? Yeah, you know, so in a smaller town, uh, people know, uh, not everyone, everyone doesn't know everyone, but we do know it, it doesn't take uh, too many layers of people or, you know, too many contacts to have a, a close contact with somebody. And so it, it can impact a smaller community, maybe more than a, a, a large one. Of course, closest family members are always going to be impacted by those. But, um, you know, it, there's ripples, I guess, that can go out through a smaller community, maybe quicker or uh, have a deeper impact uh, because somebody at the bank may have uh, been family members or friends with somebody with suicide. And, they, of course, kids at school may have uh, been involved with it, whether they knew them or family members. So it, it doesn't you know, then you're dealing with the family members that will be coming in. And so um, I, I think in, compared to a small, a large town, the smaller communities probably have the deeper impact um, just because there are so many people that tend to know that person or, you know, somebody who and, and was involved um, with that person. And so um, there's, you know, there's, there's a need. And as I'm thinking about it, we definitely could have a need for training um, and maybe different training from what somebody that lives in an urban area um, for for rural uh, for rural physicians or rural providers. So we we definitely hear uh, folks talk about kind of that need for training, but I also heard you mention before um, 
resources? What what do you need from your own healthcare team, um, from the broader healthcare community around you, and just from in general the community? So non clinical resources to support patients who may be suicidal or that you're um, worried about being suicidal. Yeah, you know if if we had a resource for for one my one of my dream resources is trying to get a full time counselor in the clinic. Um, and that's something I'm working towards. Hopefully, hopefully in the next year or two, would have that. But aside from that, just having those known, uh, whether it be a crisis counselor that would be local, um, that we could either come to our clinic. I mean, I think that'd be ideal. Somebody who could be here quickly, uh, although that would that would be hard to do to have every rural community having a crisis counselor. Could be a, a known crisis hotline that maybe we already had a relationship with. Um, I, I think that would be the ideal scenario to have some, some crisis counselors or crisis hotlines where we have a relationship versus just a typical maybe crisis hotline that we're calling that they don't know who we are and we don't know who they are. And it's hard to know, uh, hard, you know, you, you want to tell, like when I first refer a patient to a cardiologist or to an endocrinologist, I can tell them, I know this doctor and they do good work and I'm sending you to them versus Somebody, I, I can't tell them, oh, I know this person. Um, I, th- I think that would be ideal. Um, possibly even some Zoom, you know, uh, resources where if, if we can't uh, get somebody in the office, we could open the computer, the laptop up and say, here, let's uh, have, a, have a conversation and with somebody who's trained in that. Um, and, and it could even be training for my staff. They don't have to necessarily be a counselor, but if they've had some training, maybe they could uh, help us, you know, because I'm going to have a patient in 15 minutes that I need to go to. And that that's the hard part is knowing we've got a full schedule and either, either you're getting behind intervening in that situation or you're having to say, okay, let's, let's quickly try to deal with this and then move on. Yeah. Right. It really doesn't feel like a situation where you can deal with it in five, 10 minutes or so. So that, that makes sense having that team around you. Um, and I guess, uh, if you feel comfortable talking through this, Dr. Lofton, um, sometimes I think it's helpful to kind of see in practice from, from a physician talking to other physicians. Um, can you talk about an example, um, again, as much detail as you're comfortable in sharing of uh, an experience managing a patient that um, either expressed that they were suicidal um, or uh, had some suicidal ideation? Um, and then um, you know, how, how that went well, and maybe an example of a uh, time where that didn't go so well, um, where you, you left that encounter and thought, man, I, I wish I would have, or I wish my team would have. Um, can you talk through that a little bit? Sure. Um, you know, so I haven't, again, I haven't had a lot of actively suicidal patients. One is we screen our patients for depression and try to take care of that on the front end by getting them either to counseling or on the right medication. Um, I'd recently seen a study that had looked at patients who had been diagnosed or had suicidal ideation or attempts. And the, um, there was a, about only 55% of those had, had um, been previously diagnosed with depression. And so looking at, you know, if, if that's missed and um, then how do we prevent those misses so we possibly can treat those patients on the front end to prevent them from getting to that situation. So we do actively screen well, with a PHQ-2 and then a PHQ-9 if it's um, PHQ-2 is positive. So we do treat that. We treat a lot of depression. And so I'm hoping my limited experience with an actively suicidal patients, because we're trying to treat those patients, we, we do treat them. We bring them back in three to four weeks, see how they're doing. And if they're improving, you know, we'll extend that. If they're not, we'll switch medicines. We'll try to get with counseling. Counseling's limited here as well. Um, and so... But so in the, just thinking back though, the last time, it's been a while since I've had an actively uh, either suicidal patient or somebody that I was deeply concerned about with suicidal risk is we would, one, as I spend time with them in the, in the office, talking to them, um, even try to talk to them about just our, our care of them and the, you know, the self that we believe they're worth something and we want to take care of them and, um, and then trying to get them to a facility in the state. We'll, we have some phone numbers we can call to try to get patients admitted. And, and I can't think of a time where I've never been able to get somebody admitted. Um, 
so my experience overall has has been good from that standpoint, but it's also been limited. Um, only because I would hope that we're we're actively screening so many people and, and treating so many people that we're trying to get them keep them from that to getting to that situation. Um, so, yeah, that that's I, I just don't have a lot of uh, thankfully a lot of uh, experience with people coming to my office suicidal um, or on the edge, so to speak. Um, yeah. And I think you bring up a great point is that if you can do some of that work on the front end of identifying those patients and actively managing them, um, it seems like that really, um, helps support patients before they get to, um, that kind of more extreme manifestation of their depressive symptoms. And, um, so, uh, yeah, I, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, I, I'd also just like to ask, you know, thinking about, again, the audience for um, this content, what would you say to your fellow family medicine physicians about um, what would be um, good to focus on if they're interested in learning more or um, really just supporting their patients more around um, suicide and reducing suicide in their communities? Yeah, I think the main thing is just uh, screening and not being afraid to ask, just whether it be something like opioid use or drug use, um, uh, not being afraid to ask because the people that are suicidal, a lot of times they're, they want to tell us or they want to tell somebody, but they're afraid to, whether it be stigma of their uh, position, you know, they're, um, maybe they have, maybe they're a minister. Um, and there's, there's preachers and that are have committed suicide or could be a fellow physician, um, or just somebody that knows, uh, knows you well enough they're afraid to admit it so um but i think asking the question and then from there is making sure i try to make sure my patients know that we care and we're going to get them the help that they need even though if we can't provide it you know whether i I say the same thing to a patient if i can't just treat your problem or diagnose it i'm gonna get you with somebody who can and so not being not being afraid to say "I, i i don't know um but i'm gonna get you the help you need and so, um, but I think it starts with screening and trying to catch those before they get to the point of, of um, doing that. And it takes a team effort uh, that you don't, as a provider, don't have to be the one who does all the screening, let your staff do it for you. Um, and they provide the answers and, and flag those positive ones so that, that you can become aware because when we have all the diabetes and high blood pressure and pain or rashes, whatever we're dealing with, it's, if it's, if you got a positive screen and gets slid in a note that you don't see, that's not helping. But I'm just, I think having that system in place to where the whole team's involved and then taking care of that patient. Perfect. Thank you. Well, that gets through uh, my interrogation of you, Dr. Watson. 